ODI HQ members meet up um, ODI League joint events. We're talking all about building trust in how organizations use data. But before we start, we're not expecting any fires or fire alarms. So if there is a fire alarm, please follow the ODI lead staff. Put your hands up. Everyone who's got a, um, a fluorescent pink t-shirt on. Um, we'll be going that way through the doors all the way to the end, down the stairs, and we'll meet in front of the Agra uh, restaurant, if you know that. Hopefully there won't be any. If there's a fire in here, we're out that door, just follow me. Um, but we're not. If you uh, need a drink, hopefully you've found one already. Um, they're over there. The loos are just by the, uh, the lifts, as you come up the lift. Um, before we start, has anyone got any questions about facilities, what's going on? And does everyone know why they're here? Are we in the right place? <laughs> So, you, so we are live streaming the event. It's on YouTube. If you would not rather be live streamed or take photos, please let us know. And we do have some stickers that we can give to people who won't be in. But you are more than welcome to take photos and tweet and do whatever you are at the Open Data Institute. Um, so that's good. Okay. Today, we have some speakers. Uh, Dylan was coming, but blows out to go somewhere else. But if we're not sort of a little bit empty chairing him a little bit, but um, if he's watching the live stream, uh, we'll remind him of that. Uh, Claire Hadfield is here. Claire's over there. Paul, Natasha, Murdo, where are you? You're over there. So they're doing a, a three, I don't know, three thing, dancing around. I don't know what they're talking, but they're going to talk to us. Peter Wells is here from the ODI, and Paul Simpkins from Arup, taking a photo over there. But before we start, I'm going to stick my oar in, if that's okay. So I'm Paul from ODI Leeds. Um, ODI Leeds is all about innovating with data, and obviously we need to have ethics when we do that. So it's quite interesting. We, well, before we came in, someone asked me to give the, the elevator pitch about uh, open data, what's the elevator pitch? Well, we have thought a lot about that at ODI Leeds. Um, and we started talking about being radically open. What's going on with the sound? Sounds a bit weird, I don't know. Um, because if you ask any organization, they're open. Everyone's open, aren't they? They'll share. But are you radically open? Are you sharing your challenges are you sharing your methods are you talking about how you're getting on are you sharing your stories the code the um, methods you're doing your techniques are you really being radically open because if you are radically open you can start to answer the question so when someone says tell me the value in sharing and being open data well we can respond by saying what do you want to get out of it what are the organizational um, objectives of your business because when we've looked at all of the um, objectives from commercial business development sharing, from creating civic value, from creating social value, from engaging with people, from being more in innovative or being more efficient, the more open you are, the more likely you are to access that opportunity. So we talk about if you are radically open, you can get a massive surplus around your data, around your organization, about your program, about everything you do, but it's hard. We now have 16 sponsors, and we always put this slide up at ODI Leeds because we thank them for their contribution and also buying into the um, sometimes um, not clear objectives about what ODI Leeds is. But all of these organizations have realized that the future is going to be more about data and more about collaboration. And it's easier if you're trying to deal with those sometimes tricky issues if you've got friends to do it with. So you now, there are 16 organizations in Leeds doing data together. And that's amazing. So can we give them all a round of applause? <laughs> and they, they can't be here today, but Northern Power Grid are our newest sponsor. They joined yesterday, so that's, that's amazing. And then we always say thanks to Data Mill North because it's... Uh, Data Mill North is almost exactly the same age as ODI Leeds, and without Data Mill North, we would not have been as successful, and Data Mill North would not have been as successful without us. It's been a fantastic uh, relationship between the two organizations, an organization that's now, I think, the 
as you say, the widest publisher of open data in the country because it's got public and private data sets on, um, and ODI leads helping them create value out of it. So um, Data More North always gets a name check uh, when we're doing stuff. So my um, uh, two penneth before we start with the other talks. So there's, we've already talked about value and surplus around data, but also data equals power. So we have to be careful with what we do. And that's one of the reasons we're here today. Data is infrastructure. So data is starting to become the thing that we build services on. Now, instinctively, we, I guess most people in the room know that, but most organizations are, are working out that actually that we are a data business. We're not an infrastructure business or a health business or a, um, a services business. We're about data and how we use that to deliver our services or programs or whatever. It certainly was the case for Northern Power Grid yesterday, who are an electricity distributor, but they've realized that they are actually a business that uses data to decide how they deliver the whole new distributed energy system that the new um, economy is going to need, need. But how do we access the value around that? What are our ethics? What's, how do we get people to trust in those organizations? And it's not about when we, a lot of it is about Facebook and a lot of it is about those people that are taking our data, but it's also how do we create the new institutions because I think we are going to have to create them that can cope with this new world of data and ownership and people being used, I mean, actually being used to drive new business models that we don't know um, or what the, not the new business models that will exist in three or four years' time that we can't predict. So how do you create those new institutions? But also, how do you keep, um, hold to account those new institutions? So, for example, in terms of health, why, I, why don't I get a notice from somebody in the NHS that says my, my family has a history of heart disease? And I get a notice that we know your family, we know how you're connected, you have heart disease, you should be doing this sort of thing. And based on the data, we expect you to do that. So I can take more responsibility for my care, but how do I hold them to account for using my data in the right way? And not using reasons because they're just reasons for not sharing that data internally within themselves to give me the best care. So there's a, there's a, a piece around how we hold those institutions to account rather than us all getting into a little bit of a techno panic. Um, and I'm not looking at you, Tom, but just, uh, but how do we get them? And there's lots of other use cases like that where the institutions that need to care for us need to be doing the right thing. So how do we make sure that that, that happens? So uh, we think it, something like this, so if you are radically open, you create massive surpluses and we, we get benefits. We are starting two new programs uh, um, and in, the, in the autumn. One is Open GovTech, so helping all of the organizations we know share um, their um, programs, their knowledge, their IP within a open um, source way but bringing the world of software and software development to some of those pieces, and, and we're calling that Open GovTech. We're gonna launch that at Wuthering Bites in September. So you're all welcome to come to Wuthering Bites for an afternoon of working out what exactly we mean by Open GovTech, um, which is gonna be amazing. Um, we're not deciding on a venue yet, but we're definitely doing it. So it's, I think it's about the 4th of September. Um, it's just after the summer holidays, so you're all welcome to come to that. And the, the last bit is Open Data Saves Lives. So speaking to my point around healthcare, how do we create a, 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 uh, an ecosystem around open data and open innovation to help the health sector deliver what it needs to do? And open data saves lives is gonna be our way of helping people do that. So how does a huge organization like the NHS collaborate with a small innovative SME um, around um, uh, how does it procure that? How does it share its data? How does something that happens in Carlisle get done in Kent? And how do you, you try and integrate all of those, um, those really complex things? We think it's around open data saves lives. And we've got some friends that want to help us do that. So um, you're all most welcome to join that. We're going to think about that um, between now and Christmas, and we're going to launch it in January. So that's what we think. But most importantly, it should be fun. So we are going to leave you with that. Lots of people scribbling things down, which is great. So this is Dylan. So I'm, I'm, 
he's, he's not here, but he's, he's, you know, he's found somewhere better to go today, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. Claire, would you like to join us? Round of applause. Before you start, Claire, um, if you've got a question, uh, we can save them up to the end, and if you think about them, write notes, or we can take them as we go. So the, when Claire's finished, we'll ask people who've got a question, as we've got a microphone that Hannah's got there, and we'll rush around and take some questions. Over to you. Thanks very much. Um, hello, I'm Claire Hadfield. I work in the data, central data management team in Co-op, based over in Manchester. And today I was just going to talk to you around how we are working on building trust and using data ethics to do that. So why is it important for the co-op? So since 1844, when these lovely gentlemen, the Rochdale pioneers, first uh, set up the co-op, they set that up to create um, a better and more fairer way of doing business. At the time, there was a lot of corrupt business and they thought it should be fairer. So they um, set it up to champion a better way of doing business, of setting high ethical and sustainable standards in our products, services and operations. And that is still at the core of what we do now at the co-op. It's very much at the core of our principles. Uh, for example, in our stores, all of our own brand products are fair trade. And we've recently launched our biodegradable carrier bags. And we've made that technology for those open and available for anyone else who wants to use that. We want to share that with them. And that's because that's just what we do at the co-op. We want to set very high ethical and sustainable standards and show that through our products and our services. So I just wanted to frame why being trusted with data is so important at the co-op. And back in 2016, uh, our AGM, Mike Bracken, who was our chief um, digital officer at the time, made a statement to our members to say that we wanted to be seen as being trusted with data. Um, it's quite a, a, a large statement and we've had many discussions since then on, on what does it mean to be trusted with data and how we can achieve that. So we, we wanted to look at how, how that can work out and how that can translate to people on the ground in everyday jobs and how they can translate that into especially working with data. We also know that, that um, being trusted with data is subjective to individuals and a lot of that depends on your data and digital literacy and how much you understand of what's being done with your data in different companies. So we also want to be taking small practical um, steps to try and achieve that. We know that it's not something that can happen overnight, that we are trusted with data. Um, so using the data ethics canvas, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, is one way that we're doing that. And also in March this year, we published an article on the ODI digital blog called um, Currency, it Trust is the New Currency, Data is the New Currency even, sorry. And that is just around how it's data is so important and being trusted with it is. And once you lose that, it can be really hard to regain that again. So the data ethics canvas, I won't go into too much detail because I, I know there was a session this afternoon and I think quite people are aware of, of what it is. Um, but we have started testing that at the co-op uh, last year. So we've been using it for around the last 15 months. And we have only used it in one of, um, one of our areas. We've got quite a lot at co-op. I don't know if you're aware. We have a retail, we have funeral care, we have insurance. We decided to test it with our digital teams. It's because they're the, the newest uh, team that we have and also because they're working with rebuilding systems and processes and we wanted to see how we can build being trusted with data into those processes from the beginning. So historically also some of these digital teams have worked in an agile way and I think that they've sometimes been hard to kind of work with data governance with those. They sometimes look at it as being a bit of a a bit of a stopper that we're getting in the way. We're just saying no to them all the time. So we wanted to think, how can we be creative with working with them? And it seems that working with a canvas this way was more creative and we really got their interest. So the way that we've run these sessions is to get the whole delivery team into a room. So we get the project manager, the delivery team, um, data management were in there and we also try and get people from um, data protection and information security in the rooms, cover all areas. 
um, we just make sure that we, we, the way we run it is we try and say to people, right, put your laptops down and everyone get involved, everyone be open, honest, share your opinions, put it on a, a post-it note and put it up on the board. Um, so these are just, we've done it with quite a few projects and I've just used four examples here. Uh, so Shifts is um, an app where our colleagues in retail can log on. They can see when are they next in work, when are they next off, what time are they and who they're working with. Guardian is a digital service that's transformed the way we do funerals. Previously, everything was held on paperwork, which was then stored in all the different offices. It's now all um, in one system in one place and can be accessed from anywhere and is obviously, as you can imagine, a lot safer. Coupons is when you go into a store, if you're a member and you swipe your card, you'll get personalised offers. And then OneWeb is around, we've got lots of different co-op websites, we're trying to get them under one URL and under one platform. So um, we've received really good feedback from all the teams that we've worked in. Um, we've been very fortunate, we've not actually received any negative feedback yet. <laughs> um, and this is just some of it now that I'm just, I'm just going to go through. Um, so one of the ones, and I really like this comment, that it was an excellent structure for a bring out your dead style session and it was really cathartic. And I, I won't say which teams um, made these comments, but with this one, I think it was seen as, as sometimes these teams work so closely together, day in, day out in the same space. And sometimes if, if they've, they've maybe got an issue or they're wondering, have we done this the right way, they've just not had a chance to air it. And the way that we run these sessions, because it's so open, they're able to, to say, you know, why did we do this? Why was this decision made? And it's really interesting. I find it to watch these teams and someone else might go, oh, actually, we did think about that. And, and they're working in a really agile way. They've just gone with it and just done it. And people go, oh, okay, understand that. So it's a really, really good session for them to look and to say, do you know what, we've, we've been worried about this, but they air the concerns. Again, clarified different interpretations of data regulations. So it's just looking at kind of policy and personal data, uh, GDPR, Data Protection Act. Um, with one of them, they weren't aware that an IP address, for example, was personal data. So they were able to look at that and think, okay, what access controls do we need to have in place? Uh, and again, at the end, we knew what we should worry about and what not to. We always find it really important when you're working through the canvas to make lots of actions and make sure we keep a note of them. So at the end, they can look through and go, okay, let's prioritize these. What's important? What do we need to look at? Or what do we not need to worry about? And again, I think that's with when the, the concerns were heard and um, an activity that wholeheartedly recommend for any teams. Uh, as I say, every time we've, we've completed a canvas with a team, they've always been, uh, at the end of it, they've wrote blogs on it and they've always encouraged other teams to, to do this with us. So the outcome, this is when we worked with the digital marketing team before we lo launched the canvas, we wanted to, we said to them, look, what's the best way of getting it out there? We were aware that sometimes governance is seen as a bit of a stopper. So we kind of came up with this kind of mission statement and outcome is that the canvas enables you to make sensible decisions on how to become trusted with data. It's not going to give you all the answers, but it's going to be able to it's going to be able to give you the, the option that you can look at what you need to concentrate on and how you need to prioritise that. Um, and that's why the actions, again, are so important at the end of what we do. So data governance, I think one of the biggest things that we have learned, and I've learned also in, um, in previous roles, I've been at the co-op for just over a year, and before that I was in the NHS, is that as soon as you mention data governance, I think some people look and they think, oh, the kind of the data police and they're here to say no and they're here to slow us down. And we found that if we kind of rebranded that to data ethics, that we got a lot more buy-in. Um, it's kind of, I guess, um, slightly trendier and, and people thinking, oh, they're here to maybe help and how we want to work ethically, especially at an ethical company like the co-op. And we've had a lot more buy-in. So I think that it's a really, a really subtle pivot to change this, but I've also noticed conversation has kind of been around data ethics has been really interchangeable with data governance. So I've heard conversations after completing a canvas where people have said, oh, you know, we really need to make sure we're working ethically with how we source this data and that we have, you know, the right sources and we have the right consent, which ultimately are kind of data governance principles. But when you kind of brand it as ethics, you get that, that real buy-in. And it's not to say that we're not kind of, um, have, we don't have good governance in place, but I think that this really shows that by rebranding it as this, we're able to get out there to those um, harder to reach communities of practice that have maybe struggled to, uh, to speak with us before.
And uh, yeah, my brief intro to how we've used uh, data ethics. So if you just wait there, oh, quite, quite loud. Um, any questions? None at all. I think I was super clear. And oh, I we've got one over there. We'll just, just hold, hold that question. <laughs> we've got one over here. Good, I don't have to use my emergency question then. That's good. <laughs> so who are you, where are you from, and give us your question, please. I'm from ODI London, <laughs> and I teach the course in data ethics, so I know, I know what, what you're talking about. But it is, my question was more about, do you tell, how do you tell your customers about your practices in data ethics and the products maybe that you're selling or in the systems that you have designed within the, yeah. the business? So um, one of the ways in which we, we tell our customers, so um, I guess ODI, you'll know the data ethics canvas, one of the, um, one of the areas on there is, is how, do we, how do we communicate what it is we're working on. So we've done this with a lot of new projects and how do we make sure that people understand why we're doing it and how it's going to help them. So I guess for each project that can, that can differ. Um, for example, with the shifts one, we made sure that there was uh, we went out to, uh, to different colleagues in stores to show them how to use it and, and the benefit of it. Again, with Guardian, um, we, that was a really great piece. We had people from all over, uh, funeral care all over, all different ages, including people that had never used um, a tablet before or <laughs> a computer before, coming to train and being really excited. So we're just, we're looking at using ethics and using that framework. We're looking at how we can make sure that we are communicating that purpose to people and depending on, on you know what it is and what the project is and, and who's involved. Um, we've also got a piece of work that we're doing in partnership with the ODI this year to look at, at how we can, how we are trusted with data and the part of that research is to speak to customers and, and um, colleagues and members to find out what they think and, and how we could then get that message back out there. So, thank you. Hello, uh, Simon from Register Dynamics. Um, I, don't, I think it's really interesting, the governance and ethics yeah. kind of duality and the rebranding, uh, really intriguing. Uh, a quick question which was, has, do you think it's changed the conversations that you've been having? So are there things that people weren't talking about when you were talking about data governance that now they're like, oh, actually, this is ethics and we should be talking about that? Or are there things that people used to talk about when it's governance and now they're just not really covered by ethics? Um, I think that within those, as we've, we've only done this within digital, I think within those agile teams that, of course, have had to you know, make sure they're complying with policy, with GDPR, um, but have, have, have kind of not really wanted to get into, I guess, as many conversations with us. And then the way we've rebranded it as ethics, especially at the COP, is they want to work in an ethical way. So how can they get involved more? And obviously, it, it goes into a lot more than just being compliant with GDPR. It's, I guess it's looking at well, okay, just because we've got this data and yeah, we're compliant with, with law, is it still the right way to use it? And I, I guess it started those conversations. So just because we've got this data and we can turn around and say, this is our right to use it, we're looking and going, but, but should we use it? And I think it started those conversations, which has been really interesting in, in how we use data in that way. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so round of applause for Claire. Thank you very much. We now have Paul, Hello. Murdo, yes. Yes. good guess, <laughs> and Natasha. Okay, right. So we have one microphone between you. Is that going to be enough? We will switch between cool. us. Cool. If you're able to do it. See, seamless if fashion. you see the, the camera, the, the screen over there, that's what's on the live stream. Okay. So if you can move that, make sure Please. you're on the live stream, that'd be good. It's okay. So useful for the live stream. Over to you. <coughs> okay. Hi. Uh, so, my name is Paul Ellingham, uh, I'm a data manager at NHS Digital. Um, oh, my <laughs> it was seamless until exactly that point. Uh, uh, my name is Murdo Moyes and I also work with Paul in uh, NHS Digital. My name is Tasha Chetwind and I'm a grad at NHS Digital. Thanks. So NHS Digital's mission is to harness the power of information and technology uh, to make health and care better uh, for the nation. Uh, and we have a set of values, four values, professional, professional people focused, innovative and trustworthy, which we've picked out on here, given that the theme is data and trust. Um, 
So we all work for the data insight and statistics uh, part of NHS Digital. Um, so we want to talk about uh, sharing code. Uh, so this, this slide is a bit more about what NHS Digital data insight and statistics uh, does. This is published on our website. Uh, so we collect data, we put that together, we do some analysis of it, interpretation of that. We distribute that safely and securely in accordance with the law. Um, and we try and provide information and insights that will change the system, otherwise there's not much point doing that bit, or that bit, or that bit, or that bit. Um, and all that within the boundary of a very safe ecosystem. Um, some would argue too safe, um, uh, too difficult to get data out of, but um, it's per people's very sensitive healthcare data at the end of the day, and we, we are very, very careful with the data that we have. Um, but what we can do is share more published data at aggregate level, and what we can do, and we don't do enough of, is share more of the actual code that we use internally, which is what we want to talk about today. Yeah, so as Paul was saying, um, as NHS Digital, we see we have a lot of data, and we uh, derive things from that data and release reports that um, historically entirely clear in terms of what methodology we use to get from the data that we collect to the data that we push out. Um, it's been a load of legacy sort of SIS and SAS type uh, packages, but as we're trying to modernize as a company and take that maturity step, we're moving them over to um, things like Python and our um, more modern technologies. And as we do that, we want to try and document um, all the processes that we're creating um, in some kind of code library where everyone can see what's going on. Um, so if you're like an academic or something, uh, you see these published stats from NHS Digital, you know exactly how they're made, um, you know the provenance of them. Hopefully that will increase the trust in NHS Digital as a company and uh, it's really good for open data principles. So um, why share code? So transparency being the main one, we want to make sure that uh, people trust us as a company, and people know where the data is coming from. Um, we also think that it's a good way to improve our processes. So um, this code library, we're having it stored on, on GitHub. Um, not quite what GitHub's meant to do, but we think it's, we think it's good. Um, and as part of the GitHub framework, you can suggest improvements. So if somebody sees a function that we've got, um, a little snippet of code, uh, say it's like, I don't know, it checks that postcode is valid. Um, maybe they see that our methodology for checking that the postcode is valid isn't quite the best it could be, and they could suggest improvements to that. And so that's a way that uh, us building, building trust and being transparent can really benefit us as well. Um, and of course, I mean, it could save time for people within the company and people externally, um, which will save money, more, more value for money for taxpayers. That's always good. Um, but yeah, we want to get your opinions on some of the things that we're doing. Um, so we, we want this project to be the best it can be. We want people to use it. We want it to save people time. Um, we just want your opinions on how you think we could make this better. We're sort of in the early stage of this project, so we're open to any opinions, good or bad, whether you'd use it, um, how you would make it better. It's just anything, really. So yeah, thank you. So, I think you're being radically open in terms of uh, NHS Digital. And my first suggestion, might you want to talk to Pete or Hannah and get hold of the data ethics canvas and run that project against it and see what, what comes of it. So that will be a, a, a yeah. first step for me. Does anyone else have any questions? I've got a question there. Any other question? Question here. I'm going to take three. I'm um, question there. I've got three questions. Perfect. Who are you? Where are you from? Any question? Hi there, I'm Andy Bennett. I'm from Register Dynamics as well. Um, and my, my question's around when you're, sh when you're sharing code, is that because other people are using it or are, are other people contributing to it? And do you find you have kind of a different bar for quality and support and documentation, but particularly quality and kind of generality of the code when you're kind of using it, just not for the thing that you designed it for originally? Anyone want to take it? So we're hoping that, that people will use the code and contribute to the code. Um, at the moment, I think people contribute into our code um, less so. We do put out how we, how we derive all the measures that we put out at the moment, but it's all in text. 
and then someone's got to take that, interpret that in the same way that we've already done, um, and write that code themselves to run that against similar data. Um, particular use case I can think of is all the health trusts in the country. They provide the data to us in the first place, so um, and, and they, they have a vested interest in knowing that what they sent to us we're interpreting right and putting out right. Um, so I'd certainly expect that the, the trusts around the country would use that. Um, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm hoping we've, we've certainly had contributions from them before around data quality saying, um, I don't think that you're quite right on this particular item, so um, can you change your methodology? And we've looked at that and gone, yes, great, brilliant, we'll change the methodology. We want to make that as easy as possible for people to do. Um, and if they can do that by actually editing the code and giving us the code, then that's a, a win for everyone as far as I'm concerned. So yeah, yeah, absolutely, you're right about the kind of standards and documentation side of things, and we're, 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 we're new, new to that, I suppose, from uh, an external facing point. Um, our, our code processes at the moment are quite team-based, so they're quite siloed. So what makes sense to one team doesn't necessarily make sense to the next team, and we want to bring that standardization um, to our own organization as well. Um, so, so yeah, absolutely, that's part of, part of doing this is about writing and authoring those standards, and part of coming here is about finding out what people want to want to see. So if there's a bit of documentation that must be on code from your perspective, then we want to know about that today. Or so or so <laughs> how, would, how would we find that? Do we just search GitHub, and you find your repo? Yeah. Hopefully. And when yeah. it's yeah. yeah. Well, all right. Okay. In the fullness yeah. of time. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So we've got a commitment on video that you are doing it, and it will happen. <laughs> um, great. So that's it's not fake. It will be on GitHub in July. Yeah. <laughs> Something will be. Yes, we will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we use AI to uh, to change. No, 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 no. We'll just that would be very ethical. We'll, so we can just do that. Yeah, we could just start, <laughs> couldn't we? Yeah, great. But so we had no, as soon as we can, we'll we'll, we'll get it out there. It's we'll happening, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's definitely yeah, happening. Absolutely. Yeah, great stuff. So we have a question here, and then one at the back. Thank you. Hi, I'm Trish Shaw from uh, Beyond Reach Consulting Limited, and I just want to ask. You know, you've mentioned about sort of standards, and you've mentioned about trying to make your coding as open as possible. But how, one, how are you kind of ensuring the diversity of thought and of people in the group of people who are actually coding? So you've got kind of a whole holistic approach to this kind of stuff. And then secondly, are you plugging into any sort of international standards like IEEE, for example, in your coding as well? Thanks. So, so we moved. I don't know if you, Murdo, you, you can take the international standards part. Um, yeah, so in terms of making sure that everyone at the company is adhering to a certain standard. We will have like an admissions process for promotion into the library. It won't just be that anybody can, uh, I don't know, create a submission and put it in. Um, we're going to have the, the, the code, well, at the moment, we're probably just going to have like mainly R and Python in it. But for instance, for Python, we're going to make sure that that code is formatted to like maybe like black or PEP8 compliant code. Um, and we're going to make sure that it's all fully commented through to make sure that um, the train of thought is very clear in the code. Obviously, we can't police small things. Um, we can't make sure that everybody complies exactly to the perfect standard of coding, but we can do the things like formatting. We can make sure that people have shown their thoughts clearly throughout the written code. We also want to balance kind of um usefulness and perfection. I think um, as an organization, we sometimes fall foul of trying to be perfect. No, and can't branch that. No, it never happens. Mm. It doesn't <laughs> happen. And um, there's times where it actually be great to just get something out there. And obviously, we can't do that with patient data, because it's <laughs> incredibly important not to do that. Um, but we can do that with code. Um, the only risk there is, is putting our hearts on our sleeves and doing it. Um, so we want to have some standards which um, mean that not anything goes on there that you've just started working on and it's your first day in the company. Um, but um, we want to make sure that it, we don't wait until it's polished, assured, 25 people have said that's okay, and it's been run for 10 years before we say that goes on there. Um, so we've got to find that balance, and we don't know what that balance is, um, but we'll, we'll hopefully work together to find that balance um, yeah. is a better way of doing it. Fantastic. Cool. Yeah. I think in terms of diversity as well, we're hoping that by putting the code on there, it lowers that barrier. So if things are commented and people know what certain things do, it'll help them to learn how to make it better. And it's if, if this person's done it like that, then you sort of understand why. Um, so hoping to get more people coding through teaching them. Fantastic. Thank you. Last question. So I'm Julia Lake from Leeds Teaching Hospitals. Um, and just to say, we are actually using some of their code. So they are sharing some. So 
a couple of well, a couple of months ago, we were looking at using artificial intelligence within some of the data in our trust, um, and they've shared some code with us because a lot of the commercial companies were charging a ridiculous amount for health service. And um, so at the moment, we're testing out some of their code to see how it works for us, and we're sharing our experience back with NHS Digital. So that's it is a, you know a lot cheaper and a lot better for us to, and they know the data, we know the data, so that's working really well. A question I had was, are you doing anything to work on interoperability? So things like we would like to share things like your mapping files or your master files, particularly around things like SNOMED coding, um, and be able to pull that back down into some of our systems. And I just wondered if there was any plans for, for that kind of interoperability, really. Um, so, so yes, our corporate reference data service is producing a lot of APIs. So there's, there's APIs out there around um, uh, organizational reference data. In fact, I think ODS are doing that themselves and we're consuming that. Um, so we'll, uh, I'm sure I'll talk to Wayne, but publish the code that, that consumes those in the same format that it's consumed into for, into for internal use. Um, um, but then other, other APIs to be created for the other reference data sets that we have. I think there's a, an ontology server. I think oh, this is not my area, but um, I think there's an ontology server in, in, the, in the works, which I think is a SNOMED, um, a way of accessing SNOMED and SNOMED subsets, which would be a really big deal for us internally as well as analysts. So that's not a promise. Do not record that. Turn the microphone. <laughs> I don't, I don't, uh, what, but uh, does anyone know what SNOMED is apart from uh, three or four people? So I think you might be safe. <laughs> Few. That's good. That's yeah. good. <laughs> but for those people, it's incredibly, uh, yeah. incredibly painful. Uh, slash important. Yeah. Um, to, yeah. To work with. Um, so, so yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Plans uh, are, are in place. Um, not, not, not for the three of us, and not, not within this project. But, but um, organisation wide, um, there's more of this kind of initiative going on. Um, obviously, we haven't kicked this off. This has come down from Chief Exec. So. Um, Sounds amazing. Fantastic. Thank you. Right. Great. Round of applause. Okay, so the benefits of doing things on the hoof are that people send their slides late in PDF format and we have to try and... <laughs> so we need to try and find... Here we go. Ta-da! Hello. <laughs> oh, Paul, I've always been told you like PDFs at Audio, I love audio Leads. Uh, wait, it's just another form of publishing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's working, but you'll have to use the arrows rather than... Yeah, that's fine. Cool. Over to you. Peter. Hi. Apologies for breaking all the technology. Uh, so, hi, I'm Peter. I work at so the Open Data Institute HQ down in London. For those who want to know where I'm from, I'm from actually from Blackpool, but I live in Newcastle. It's complicated knowing who people are and where they're from. So in this talk, I just wanted to just talk a bit about actually building trust and that concept of building trust. And this is a flash talk, so I'm going to end with questions, not answers. The, and, at, and at the ODI, we say we work with companies and governments to build an open, open and trustworthy data ecosystem. That's the thing we're trying to do. You know, we want people and communities and organizations to use data to make better decisions. And it's the decisions that are key. It's those decisions that are helping people and that are improving people's lives and improving our society. That's what we're trying to do. But protecting them from harmful impacts. If we go too open, we get fear. If we respond too much against the fear, sometimes we get data hoarding and the golems holding onto their data within big organizations and saying, it's mine, it's oil, I must look after it forever. The, I'm trying to find this balance between that hoarding and that fear of how we get the most benefit, how we get the data as open as possible while respecting privacy and confidentiality, so then as, ma as many people as possible can get access to it, can create things from it, 
and the th lots of things we create then meet different needs and as many people as possible can make decisions about it that create positive impacts. But it's about finding the balance between the two. The, and one of the things we do on there, actually sorry, on that slide, you'll see that we're, we work on, so Paul mentioned the infrastructure thinking to try to help get things open. Open innovation, like a lot of the activities that happen here at Leeds, capability building, so people like Violetta over here doing learning and training with people, or Stuart at the back, you know, building tools and helping with capability of organisations when he's not handling the audio, the AV for events like this, and crying when people don't speak into the microphone. The, um, the trust, we've got a lot on ethics, which has been talked about, equity, how we get a f an equitable access to the data, equitable share the benefits from the decisions made by the data, and engagement, talking with people, and talking with organisations about what we're going to be doing with data that they may hold or that's about them and those issues. And we do practical tools. So as mentioned, the Data Ethics Canvas by Claire, you know, which is on its third public iteration. So we're trying to build practical tools there to help people make better decisions and build trust or retain trust. The, you know, and we iterate that because practical tools, you need to keep learning what works. You know, it's just like a software product. So just like that source code NHS Digital, you have to keep iterating it to make it better, to keep working it. Similarly, tools like the Canvas, physical things need iterating, or Paul and Catherine in the space here at ODI Leads, you know, constantly changing the space as they see what works and what doesn't. And the Canvas, I won't dwell on that, you'll see it around. But there's a thing around trust, of who do we trust? I mean, people in the room, does anyone know who this is? And do we, this is a guy called Tom Forth, who's on holiday, I understand at the moment, but do we trust Tom Forth? People in the room trust Tom? He's, I don't know if he's watching it. The, I mean, he's not here. I mean, because sometimes, you know, I'm not saying we trust the wrong things, but sometimes we might trust the wrong things. We're humans. You know, Paul, no, Tom isn't here in the room. Maybe Tom doesn't exist. Maybe there's just been fake video footage on the BBC of Tom talking about buses. Now, maybe that's been faked. Maybe the things Tom are doing aren't making things better in the way that I would want. I trust Tom. I'm a northerner. I'm all in favour of more decentralisation in the UK. But for other people, it's a different thing around that trust. Other people might just say, he's wearing a hat on his Twitter profile at the moment. Should we really trust someone who's wearing a hat in their Twitter profile? Sorry, Tom. I just thought I'd speak about you while you weren't here. So there's a thing about, about the difference between trust and trustworthiness. Okay, so there's a deliberate reason why in the ODI, in the ODI strategy and in our mission, we talk about trustworthy data ecosystems. So an ecosystem that's worthy of our trust, not just that we trust, but that is worthy of our trust. They're two distinct acts and two distinct steps. You know, say because sometimes we trust the wrong things because we don't know what to trust. We don't know how to assess if something is trustworthy or not. So I suppose one of the big messages I give out to the organisations and people in the room is focus on that, focus on being trustworthy, focus on doing the right things and demonstrating your commitment to act in ways that are trusted that people actually want. Focus on following through in that commitment and being competent in that commitment. And for anyone who doesn't recognise those words or anyone who does follow their, uh, <coughs> their philosophy, there's a woman called Baroness Anora O'Neill, who I strongly recommend reading on these topics. She's fantastic at unpicking, very, very simple and clear language, the difference between these things and how to look at things that are trustworthy. But in our world and in technology and data and all these issues, we're not, not quite sure how people assess trustworthiness. How am I going to know if something is worthy of trust? You know, it's not just because they appear on the BBC. It's not just because they're using the data ethics canvas. People can use our data ethics canvas, but not follow through on the decisions that it's telling them what to do. You know, how do citizens, how do I attress, assess trustworthiness? What information is available to me? Is that trustworthiness in a product, in an organization, in a data set, in a bit of code? All of those things are slightly different qualities. And if I'm looking at something to assess if it's trustworthy, I might be looking for different things to help me make that decision at a particular point in time. And so you get into that, again, it's 
quite nuanced little point, but it's really quite important when you think about humans and how humans act and behave, of how do we help people trust what is trustworthy? So how do we get information to people at the right point? How do we work out why people are trusting some of the things they are and adjust that so they're trusting the things which are actually worthy of trust? And then that's human behavior. It's incredibly complex stuff because we're humans and we are wonderfully complex and long may it remain so. So that's one of the big challenges, I suppose, at the ODI we're thinking about next and how do we take a, a practical approach to assessing things that are trustworthy or not and a practical approach driven by actions, not just talking and thinking about it like I'm doing that now because talking out loud helps me work out what I think. That's one of the reasons I do it. The, so how over time do we work out how to assess what's trustworthy in the world of data and tech? How do we help people find out what's trustworthy and trust those things rather than maybe some of the other markers they've been using? And that's what I wanted to say and pose today. If you've got thoughts on how to do that, grab me afterwards and I'll apologize again to Tom Forth. Sorry, Tom. Okay, um, questions for Pete or Peter? That's a good question. Is it Pete or Peter? What do you prefer? Uh, Peter, otherwise my mum gets upset. Right, so she you're, can more, hear, she can you're hear more trustworthy you. as a Peter. Okay, right, okay. Questions for Peter. Got a question here. Any other questions? I've got a question as well, so that's two. We'll try and get three. Someone else think of a question, then we'll do it. Um, how... Who are, who are you? And what's my, my name's Alison. I volunteer with um, Leeds Teaching Hospitals, Health Watch, um, and Leeds Involving People and the CCG. What I was coming to is, is part of that the risk that applies and the alternatives, as in part of your judgment about the trustworthiness, is that not a factor of, of the risk that's attached to what you're trusting? and also the alternatives that are available to what's proposed. So isn't part of it that equation, if you like? Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, yes, very much so. It's, it can be about the alternatives. Sometimes they have to just trust something to get some things done. The, I suppose one of, the, one of the most extreme examples of that, which is often very relevant, so uh, Paul mentioned Facebook yep. at the beginning. So I... I go to I go and speak with politicians a lot about uh, data use and things like that. And people tell, and I always get people telling me, "You tell me people don't trust Facebook and how they use data." And they say, "But look at all these people using Facebook." And actually, it's just a case of it's the only option. So they've just got to put some trust. They've got to put an element of trust in it because there sometimes is no other choice to get certain things done. Yeah. Because the person you want to speak with, they're on Facebook too. Yeah. Okay, um, so my question, just uh, this week, uh, as often, people volunteer ODILEs to do stuff, um, which is great, um, but today, uh, this week, the conversation has been about transport and how we don't have a mass transit system and our bus is great, but buses are terrible at the same time. But could we um, crowdsource a transport map of Leeds using the GPSs that we all have in our pockets and who owns that data? And could we create? Is there a vehicle or a, a way in which we could volunteer our data in a trustworthy way to something that could share that data with a specific purpose? Pete, <laughs> is there something like that that's, that's emerging that you're aware of? So, uh, I think the thing you you may be referring to a thing called a data trust. Yes, a, da <laughs> cool. a data trust so, maybe. Yeah. Right. So if I again zoom back to so Paul was talking earlier about new institutions or changed institutions. So there's a thing as well about the trustworthiness of historically we've created some new institutions to tackle particular problems. So uh, co-op is a great example. The co-op emerged out of a certain range of uh, a certain range of structural things that were happening in the in the 19th century, wasn't it? Watched up ideas. The semi trade unions emerged, or clubs, or cups, or businesses. Businesses weren't a concept that existed forever. So they emerged to do certain things. So data trusts are a, a concept we're exploring at the moment at the ODI. We're doing various pilots and projects and practical work around, which are a legal structure to provide stewardship of data with trustees. So like the trustees have for charities and organizations or hospitals, hospitals and schools, et cetera. 
who make sure that all of the various stakeholders are represented in the decisions and that decisions about how the data is used is for uh, for the good of the people of Leeds so they can get to Kirkgate Market yeah. to get their Yorkshire pudding Christmas wrap, Sunday lunch wrap or thing. Or Manji's Kitchen, which we would prefer. Yeah. Um, so just as a show of hands, who, if, we set, if something was set up in Leeds which said a specific reason, which was we want to improve transport in Leeds, but we don't know enough about it, but we would like to take your movement data about everything you do and apply it for that specific reason. Who would join in with that without any problem? I think I probably would. I'd give my data for that reason. Is that half the people? Yeah. About half. So about half the people. What, what the amount of you need? What do you so we probably need 25% to make a, a decent model of what's going on in Leeds, don't you? So we might need to do a trial about that. In, yeah, in well, we're missing out sections of society, those who don't carry mobile phones, which is worth my profit. Who may be using... So the, the question, just in case people didn't catch that up, because that, just on the video, the live stream, th th there's a question about inclusion, and would we pick up everyone who um, doesn't have a mobile phone or a... Uh, However, most people have a mobile phone, they just don't have a data plan. So there's, I think there's something around how do we make the data plans available for people. Um, so I think trying to solve a problem creates different actions, which is great. So there's a question, so um, Paul over there, you're up next, so we can get the microphone over to Paul. You can ask the question, there we go. That, Thanks. Oh, yeah, it's just... I, I you saw your name and where you're from? Come on. Paul from Arup. I'm talking as a, as a lead citizen here. I'm really interested in what you just asked because my first reaction was i would be quite happy to, set, to, to share my cycling journeys and my bus journeys and all kinds of other transit-related yeah. yeah. things because probably, they're probably all on social media anyway, but I'll kind of be slightly nervous about the idea of all my movements being tracked. So is there a way of doing it in a sort of a slightly... Um, so I'm glad that's exactly. Yeah, you know, exa that, that I think that's exactly the yeah. conversation we need to have. But we really it's could do yeah. with. Um, so is the, can we filter that? Don't know, but we should be able to, shouldn't we? So Steve's got a point. I was just going to say to Paul, aren't Google doing it already? So unless you know, if you go into Google Maps, you can pick a date in the year, and it will show you exactly where you've been and you any minute that. of the day. And you could use a download from a take. Uh, Google Takeout, there's a function on Google where you could extract the data and provide it to Paul yes. and his data trust. And you could give it to me and we could use it. Great. So uh, we've got time for one more question on this bit and then Paul's up next. Lady at the front. Doesn't it come down to the purpose really and kind of what the outcome is you're trying to achieve by it? Because what you don't want is that data being used to make inferences about you. So if it tracked your movements that you went to a kind of you went to a hospital and then you went to a breast clinic, you know, that you've got cancer or and you hadn't been telling your family or for, for some other people in the room they may be going to a very salubrious store or bar or <laughs> joint uh, and then be quoted later. That's the inference that we're you know. Yeah, the infra I think is, but there's also don't judge us by your standards. So Absolutely. We're, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. so that there's the, uh, you might do that. That's but not my standards. <laughs> but but, but, but we, the trust would set itself up yeah. very clearly that we're only using it for this purpose, and if we use it for anything else, we, you would find out because we'd be very transparent about it. Absolutely. And being as open as possible is the best form of governance, we found. So, but it's fascinating. And, and, but we've also got to try and create a way of doing it really quickly. So if we wanted to just start sharing our, our Google movements um, and download it and share it anyway, why wouldn't we do that? So there's, there's ways of moving quickly on this as well. Okay, that's fascinating. And, and we've got time for chatting later. So Pete, Peter, see mum. Thanks very much, round of applause for Peter. <laughs> Paul, if you could join us, I've now got to find your another PDF uh, PowerPoint. That's, that's PowerPoint. Well, no, PowerPoint um, presentation. So you can, there we go, it's working. Is that, is that it? That's it, isn't it? Oh, I suppose it's like before that, one before. Is that, is that in PDF then? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll have to scroll like crazy. Yeah, you do your scrolling. 
So Paul Simpkins from Arup, sponsor of ODI Lee, he's been here from the start. Um, over to you, Paul. I'll get my idea. Yeah, get your Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm talking, um, Camilla, Camilla's not here. She works in uh, London and she's um, an, an, an award ceremony tonight, actually. But I'm going to just sh quickly share two explorations and they're probably like pebbles in a pond. Hopefully they, they um, are relevant to the discussion. I guess they're um, really about um, moving beyond the organisation and um, uh, ways that we make decisions and build collective insight in sort of the civic space. I've come from a sort of architecture, urban systems uh, background and how we build collective insight. Um, I think some of, lots of the things that we've been talking around are, are again around purpose. So this, these, are, these are kind of prototypes of practical tools, quite fun things. This is something that Camilla did recently in uh, Copenhagen was the first outing with um, Interactive Spaces Urban Studio, which is a small um, not-for-profit kind of um, urban innovation. Uh, studio and uh, actually what it was about was um, tw it's called 25 questions for, for livable cities and I guess so the purpose was around exploring the role of technology in creating livable cities and um, it was a f it was an interaction of 25 opposing sets of questions um, on these digitally enabled cones which were kind of designed as a bit of an installation that people just interacted with um, and they were able to go around and sort of sim simply um, express various opinions. So each one was kind of like um, a polling station. Um, or, um, and although all the, the sets of questions were quite simple, um, they were really trying to get expl exploring how you could build up quite a complex view of city making decisions um, by asking some quite simple, uh, fun things. And this is very much a prototype. And we think that we could probably be deploy this with different sets of questions for different purposes. It was digitally enabled and then fed into a website. And I picked out a few of the 25, which were kind of linked to the ideas of trust and trust in space. There was, quite, there was all kinds of things, you know, should homes be required to have smart meters? Should public health data be open source? But things like, should carbon footprint of individual citizens be unknown to the government? Or should it be known so we can make better tax decisions? Um, and should, so there's a whole range of different questions, 20, 25, should councils be trusted more than algorithms to grant building purpose? They're kind of fun, but they came, they, when, when you kind of played around with these, you could get an instant feed out of the kind of the, the current status of opinions, and then you could um, play around with sort of consensus over time, and it began, began to explore various sets of values coming out of these questions in public and private and the ideas of re rethinking public value. In this particular case, they're exploring attitudes towards di digital technology and how it should be deployed. Um, so uh, this was quite a fun way of exploring how you can get in and, 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 and make, um, uh, uh, maybe explore this decision making in, in the civic space. And uh, the second part of this lightning talk is um, something that, again, Camilla worked with me on, but I've been doing over the last few couple of years is really looking at um, health and well-being as a kind of, I guess you'd say we've talked about purpose. This is really mission-oriented oriented thing, thinking a lot about how and why we make decisions in cities. And could health and well-being actually be one of the best lenses around which we could kind of gather some consensus that health and well-being outcomes for citizens is... Um, is a, good, is a good thing. And then that led down a, an interesting route of looking into the whole health sector and the wider determinants of health and all of the different health assets which are defined as any factor or resource which enhances the ability of individuals, com communities, populations to maintain and sustain health and well-being. And this wheel, um, which is um, going across whole six dimensions from climate and ecosystem right round to personal capacity and lived experience, I became quite interesting when you think of all of these things as assets. There's different terms, different language around this from the way people talk about assets in the built environment to how they might talk about it in a, an asset-based community development kind of context. But assets is an interesting notion in terms of where people assign value as well, where people invest, where people act. Um, so this is actually, in a way, very, very simple, but quite a challenging frame for how you could um, think about place. And we're exploring whether this might be a really good way to build collective insights, so we've recently been doing some stuff with, with leads actually, but you, mi mixing some of these techniques in with other things like stickering and playful stuff and building things, but also, you know, as well as da you know, data being not necessarily digital, 
um, how might we begin to get a deep understanding of place using this framework of, of, of assets and um, actually prioritizing what exists in the community, where you want to get to, and sort of ideas around that. Um, so it's really just a framework to harness collective insight. So when someone says, I think the NHS, uh, we want to use insight to change the system. Where do you sit in this system? Because this is the city system. And what kind of insight are you feeding into this system to change this? system. It's an interesting urban challenge. Um, and just finishing up with a couple of slides as we began, this is really sort of an ongoing exploration, but what's important about having this kind of holistic framework? Well, on the left, it kind of really links things like global ecosystem to personal. How do the lived experience of people in deprived communities relate to the climate emergency? How do we, how, you know, how do we um, engage at community scale and with wider urban systems? How, how do we understand the interdependencies right across this, this holistic asset framework? Um, where, where, where do people kind of sit in that, in that wheel? And, you know, people talk about interoperability. That's kind of civic interoperability. Um, how do we invest our collective pound? And I'm not saying that's even necessarily monetary investment, but we really need to get our head around how we share and value and invest in, 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 in assets across the whole system. And how does this relate back to data? Well, there's a massive range around this wheel of types of data from stuff at ecosystem which might be sensor based but around sort of personal capacity where we've got all kinds of complexities around sentiment and personal opinions and personal data big challenges but massive opportunities if we can find a way also to bring quantitative data in as well as qualitative how do we align multiple voices um system voices community voices you know um health data and facts with, with qualitative insight to get some sort of consensus around the mission, around purpose. Um, and on the right, maybe one of the most important things is how do we make sure that this doesn't kind of eat itself in some kind of you know, system of metrics? That can be really important, but it's kind of having the conversation that's appropriate for the context, um, the level of detail that's appropriate. What actual level of detail do people need to make decisions? What actually do people use to make decisions? Is it metrics or is it actually stories? Um, so I think this is really a journey of different ways of deploying this, um, but maybe quite an interesting way to think about how you might host the insights from your different um, organisations in order to um, actually make civic decisions with the right outcomes. And that's kind of that. There's some, there's some links there and more background and stuff online. No, you keep that. Yep, is that okay? <laughs> So it's, it's always brilliant when um, people start to place what we're thinking in, in terms of a place and what it means to us as we're living in it and how we make decisions. And um, for, I'd like to ask you, so you work in property, construction, building things, Arab, Arab yeah. does. Arab, yeah. D do, uh, does the property industry have a data ethic, a, a property ethics canvas? Do they have ethics and do they just, or do they just get on with it? Um, I'm sure the property industry has ethics. <laughs> um, <laughs> in terms of their data ethics, I'm not actually, as you, yeah. Yeah, I'm not actually an expert in data ethics. I'm I am interested in, um, yeah, I guess um, the the way that we collectively um, yeah. decide how we make decisions is probably what this this space yes. is. So each of those yeah. different sectors has a role to play, both with its own organisation, but then how it shares it and for what civic, what sort of purpose. Um, yeah, I don't know if I've quite answered your question. No, but, uh, but, but I think it's be fascinating way to compare that world yeah. with the world <coughs> we talk about in terms of data and digital services in that we seem to be going round and round and talking about ethics where other industries are, have done it for, and they're getting on with it. And we, could sh be, we should think about that. Yeah, the kind of link I was thinking about is maybe there's a whole range of things about safety and um, protection of individual rights relation, related yeah. to data, which could all be satisfied, and you could have a completely ethical and trusted data policy within your organization. But that's a different thing to deciding whether your organization has uh, got a policy about delivering wider social out outcomes. Yeah. So that, that might be a different part of your policy, but it, you might perfectly ethically not share information, <laughs> which could be transformational in that system. So yeah. what things can we all collectively share into that yeah. to really we change the sort of way that we co-invest in place? Yeah. And that, that's a sort of a wicked problem, actually. About how do we hold those to account yeah. to make sure that we do the right thing? Yeah, yeah. okay. Cool. Um, questions? Because me and Paul could talk forever, yeah. about all this, <laughs> as you probably guessed. Uh, any questions for Paul in that? So we've got a question here. Any other questions? 
people think about that while you, yeah, so yeah. Who are you, where are you from, and your question, please. Um, my name is Aggie, I work in construction as well, in property management, and what I found is the sector is not really driven by data by any, any way, because it's private sector, nobody really wants to share the information. Do you have the same, the same thing about it, or do you, would you be happy to share what you do in your company with a wider pool of people? I think it varies massively across our company because we don't just do property, we do um, environmental planning, we do city strategy and economics and socio-economics and all, uh, and all that kind of stuff. And all, uh, all, a lot of this stuff is actually in our own funded research, which we often just open source. So um, there's different kinds of insight um, and sometimes it's not appropriate. You know, we work for clients, we work for all kinds of different organizations. Um, I, I think in terms of a lot of the internal um, insight and research and foresight we normally kind of open source a lot of it um or or, or at least sort of get it get it out there so people can share it um but yeah it's quite a difficult question to answer and i think as you know when you work for clients and organizations you you also have to respect what what their um structures are <coughs> any other questions we've got one at the back to paul i'm gonna get a last question Okay, great. Last question, and then we'll we'll wrap up. Hi, I was interested about the um, the feeding into uh, feeding healthcare data into the space decisions, and uh, and and part of that's kind of the feeding this the the healthcare spend as well into those space decisions. And I know that kind of spending on mental health <laughs> saves money in physical health. It's not just the right thing to do yeah. to have that priority. It's also financially sound. Um, mm. And the same could be, is true of spending on social care, and is the same true of spending on space? So should you, instead of doing this, should you spend money on a park or something? And my question is, um, how do you kind of build the trust or the political change or the uh, evaluation of the political value in things that take a long time to pay off? So building a park like that would pay off in yeah. people's healthcare over time. But how do you get that within a political uh, cycle I, or something like that? And how do you tackle that kind of thing? It's a wicked problem, and that's where a lot of this came out of. I mean, how do you prescribe a tree? You know, um, it, it, you can prescribe a tree, but you can't prescribe a tree now for someone because it's going to take 25 years. You, the, the, but in all sectors, this issue exists. How do you get large capital projects to be able to invest revenue money in supporting community champions or, 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 or things that build community resilience, even though they know that they kind of work? And how how does social prescribing mean that the payment structures change so that you're not reliant on organizations you don't fund, et cetera, et cetera. So all of this thinking originally came out of going, well, what is it that brings those different wicked problems together? Time scales, organizational structures, um, you know, silos around different sectors. Um, we need some kind of collective mission. And this kind of idea that health and well-being could be a good one. Um, yeah. Actually, when you actually look at the way that the health sector looks at the wider determinants of health completely in the round, it's a pretty inspiring way to think about um, all those different things and how we co-invest. So uh, we can start big or we can start small. Um, we have a, a hackathon we're running on, is it the 15th and 16th or 16th and 17th of July? 16th and 17th of July at um, Cloth Hall Court um, with, supported by Yorkshire Water, but not, it's not Yorkshire Water's thing. So they're doing a two-day uh, UK-wide conference on impact measurement, and it's all about this sort of thing. We're measuring the impact of an organisation in its whole, and uh, can you measure that, and is it possible? Um, and it's really hard. But, um, so they've got a conference where people are talking about that, and policy and strategy, but we're LDI leads, so we want to build something and do something. So we, uh, they're downstairs, we're upstairs building stuff. So there's an open invita invitation to people here to join us in those two days. You don't have to come for the whole two days, you can come for parts of it. But it's all about, do, you, do we have data which we can measure different parts of the, the circle that, that Paul mentioned there? But importantly, how can we share? And how do we share at the right time? So at one point, the, uh, a, a hospital might be ready to share, but they might, uh, but a, a local council might not be. Someone's making a large investment. We know that um, the Environment Agency are investing millions of pounds in flood defences between here and Bingley to help the catchment. 
that's going to impact a lot of people's lives around mental health, around fear of flooding, around green space, a whole load of stuff. But we know they're finding it hard to share what they're doing with other people. So we'd love you all to join in with that. So we, we have some things or tools we think we can help with. So uh, please join in, I think is what we're, we'd like you to do. So that's one uh, little shout out. We've got a question there. And any other points? Great. Uh, so my name is Richard Thomas. I'm from Department of Work and Pensions. Uh, I have a, uh, a probably quite unstructured question. Uh, I, th I thought the observation following the previous talk and, and uh, uh, extrapolation about uh, sharing, uh, sharing data for a uh, good purpose uh, without a specific service being consumed is a really interesting one. On, on a similar kind of theme uh, in, in relation to some of the points that you made about sharing investments in, in a similar space, do you think that there's uh, something about uh, sharing relatively unstructured data about ge more general ambitions, never mind just investment, and this probably isn't quite so specific to the engineering and Arab one, but uh, about uh, general ambitions as well as um, uh, less structured conclusions that people have drawn from projects more generally, uh, not just thinking, uh, so if I wanted, I'm interested in uh, doing a bridge thing. Yeah. I'm going to translate this. So we talk a lot about helping people to think out loud. Um, and if you, Paul, um, Peter mentioned about talking, I do, I do all my thinking speaking because you start off and you're not quite sure, but we help people to think out loud about their problems. And once you start doing that, other people join in and you then get in a conversation and then you start to work out okay that would work and then you understand more about their context and yours and you then can work out a problem so i think what you're saying is if you work in dvp and you were working out loud on the web in a searchable format about your problems and challenges you may get to your answer quicker or you might find some friends that are also working in that which would allow you to maybe skip a few steps in your progress so that's that's where we're um that's what we would talk about is how we help how we help you think out loud, but also allow, if you allow, we think about projects where we, you, you forget about engaging with people. So a lot of projects you say, we're going to engage, we're going to do this process. You say, no, we're going to make our project as open as possible so people can reach in when they're ready. And it's on the web and it's permanent, so it's there. And they might not be ready until 18 months after you've finished your project. But at least it's there in the, on the web and you've shared all your code and your projects and your stories. And they can use it and maybe get in touch with you. So that's maybe, I, I think that's, I tried to structure your unstructured <coughs> point. So I, I, I just yeah. come, come yeah. to an, answer that as well. From, I mean, I, I, it's interesting when you said that uh, maybe not interesting to our app from the built, but that middle wheel is where we're at. You know, w built is one part of six. Yeah. And you've got somebody else doing environmental stuff saying it's not part of the natural environment. You know, health is probably, some, uh, yeah. We're not about. We, we, we need to all become about the whole, the whole wheel yeah. and where we sit with it within that system. And, abs and absolutely, the challenges there are that we need to understand different ways of gathering insight, different ways of interpreting insight, and different different men ways of valuing it as well. You know. Yeah. Um, so um, the chal I think that ev even the language around, say, a conference or an event, you know, influences who comes there. Um, what does an asset mean to somebody building a bridge and what does an asset mean if, if personal confidence is an asset? You know, how do we get this on the same, um, on, all, on, all on the same page where everybody's saying the same things about, you know, it's, it's a challenge and that's what we need to all work towards. I think. So, so I, I want to ask in, in terms of the semantics of it and, and just general working practices as, a, as an individual and for events, uh, that's very valuable. And, and it's a good point about the sharing aspect as well, uh, just more generally sharing code and promoting that and working with people who mm. facilitate that. Yeah. Uh, what I'm asking is more specifically, is there a technological solution? So I'm thinking an extrapolation of the kind of work that Aaron Schwartz was doing uh, with healthcare documents to uh, aggregate studies in a programmatic way in order to uh, provide better insight. I'm wondering if there's something that could be done from so, uh, so we we probably wouldn't start with projects. a technical technological solution, but some other people would. But uh, um, there's probably a conversation we can. And I think that's where the an, yeah. the an, that's where that livable cities thing kind of started saying. You know, okay, I'm pretty sure because I come from an engineering background, and one of the things I realised is there's a techno fix 
for everything, but actually they're not, they're not going to be enough. So I'm pretty sure that people could find ways to generate all kinds of insight, and that, but the trust and the ethics about what insight and also what decisions are made with that is, is really the thing that will, will control how, how that's deployed, I think. Um, so I'm going to not, not the technical yeah. capability. So I, I'm thirsty, I'm sure other people are. But we'll finish up by, and, and we would love, and I think what we'd like you to take away is um, ODI HQ team are here. They're here with their uh, ethics canvases. I'm sure there's some there. There's some tote bags as well, I think. But swag is here. So you can, put your, you can put your canvas in a tote bag and take it home, which would be amazing. But also think about how you can use it in your practice. It's all open source. It's on the web. Find it. Um, and use it and feedback um, and from us it's radically open massive surplus and Paul me and Paul will talk about it all afterwards if you want to do that so thanks very much Paul uh, you we've got the, the cold beers are over there please make some new friends um, over to you guys thanks very much